So with the advent of genomic sequencing then, it raised for us many more challenges. And I think for research ethics, one of the biggest challenges, if you're going to give results back, which was sometimes the only way people that wanted to access genetic information get it, if you're going to be able to get it back, um, then what's the difference between research and clinical? I mean, we're, this graying of these categories, I think, increasingly is creating a lot of questions for us about are we overprotecting in one context and not protecting enough in the other context? And also, as we get more and more big data and more and more technology, there appears to be increasingly this argument that we're holding on to old values about privacy. Let's just give it up. And I think some of us old timers are resisting that. You know, these are still core principles. Let's figure out how we can accommodate this. There was increasing concern, even from the beginning of the discussion about the mapping of the human genome, but increasingly for many years from the mid 90s on, um, on how could we send the message as a matter of policy that if you are a healthy person, but you've got some predictive information associated with you, that you won't be discriminated against and that your privacy will be protected. So in the mid-1990s, I got involved with doing some scholarship on that, looking at first what all the states were doing. And so I did an analysis of that. And from that, um, we started to realize that we needed to try to have a federal comprehensive approach. And in 1995, together with, I was at the law school at the time, but together with the National Action Plan on Breast Cancer and the Human Genome Institute, we did a series of two workshops, one in 95 and I think one in 97. 95 was on health insurance and the second one was on workplace. And we um, wrote two pieces in science that came out that were um, very, um, I think, well received certain, in certain areas that became the framework for what you would need to have if you were going to have protection against genetic discrimination and privacy. And at the core, which is a, for, at least for me, is I felt you had to marry anti-discrimination protection with privacy. So it wasn't just about saying you can't discriminate against somebody if they have a positive BRCA test, but also um, you can't get that information because you have to, because it's very hard to prove discrimination. Because you think about it, if you're black or if you're a woman, you see it. But you don't see this, right? So you risk a lot in trying to make a claim that you've been discriminated against. You risk less in the other context because they're looking at you. You're not disclosing anything private by saying you're a female. But here you are. And what if you guess wrong? Or what if you don't have good protection? So I said you have to get at it at the access point, not only at the discrimination protection. Well, so. This took 15, almost 15 years. I mean, this started in 1995, and it was in 2008 before GINA was passed. Well, the GINA genetics non-discrimination, genetic information non-discrimination act, GINA. Um, what ultimately got passed was nothing like what we started with because it didn't have a private right of action, for example, and it almost passed unanimously, and George Bush signed it. So that should make you think, you know, we had bipart total bipartisan support for this. The regs are now out. Now we have the Affordable Care Act. So it's a question about how much we needed in the context of health insurance, but it still has the privacy provisions. And there are frustration in some members of the community. Well, what about life insurance, long-term care insurance, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I don't know if anything's going to happen with that. But 
the rationale for doing all this is because the studies have shown that people don't want to be in research because they're fearful. All right. I'm not sure that's right. I think it's a socially acceptable excuse to say I'm afraid because what you're really afraid about is the information and what you're going to do about it. Are you going to tell your sister who doesn't want to know? How are you going to keep a secret? When do you tell your children? You know, it's a lot of psychosocial baggage. Well, that's very hard to quantify. And you can't discriminate against people not liking you or being afraid of you or wanting to get away from you. How are you going to do that? So this is the way we do things. And, but the research community is frustrated by this because when they go through the informed consent process and you know the studies show that you know people don't really either remember this or they don't really understand it or they don't even know about it and also i used to say you know researchers didn't go to school to be you know insurance agents you know or discrimination describers you know that's not what they're all about and so I think and it's very hard to quantify it because we supposedly don't see a lot of it well how would we really know you know so that's been in in an area where I've done a lot of work over the years I don't know how much difference has really made but it was it made for really interesting bedfellows <laughs>